That's hilarious. So, all right, let me see how much everyone has read. So we're going through C.S. Lewis's The Great Divorce. This is the old, the way the book looked like in the 2000s. And, um, and so, so, uh, so we're going through that. How much has everyone read? Has everyone read all the way through it yet? Yeah, so, so Glory has, Carol hasn't. The, uh, you two have, Coley, did you get through any of it? I got through, yeah, but I didn't think I needed to read all of it for week one. So no, 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 no. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just asking. I'm just asking. I did the preface. Yeah. I did. Yeah, yeah I did chapter, the preface one. chapter one. Okay. All right. So, so it's. I didn't. I didn't actually pick this up to look at it until until um, uh, like this week, and so and so that's because I've read it. Cool, 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 cool. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, that's great. That's great. So it's um, if everyone had read all the way through it, I was going to teach differently. So the um, but the book is about. So I thought the book was like six chapters, and it's actually like I think twice that. Yeah, a little over twice that. So so read a few more than just just one going going forward, or it's going to take forever going going through here. Because I was like when I started reading, I was like, oh, whoops. Because in my mind, there's some logical changes that happen. And the, the first kind of section is kind of like the first first few chapters, but it, it doesn't really matter. So, so um, all right. So we all kind of kind of read some of this. And uh, so this story, C.S. Lewis is a, a turn of the century, um, kind of second World War uh, kind of era uh, author. Um, you, you know him for Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe. Um, his other probably really famous book is Mere Christianity, which Mere Christianity is a collection of essays of his that he delivered over the radio, um, kind of on kind of a, a defense of Christianity. A lot of people really like Mere Christianity, and it's pretty good. It's pretty good. Um, he also wrote, uh, P- P- uh, Carol and Gloria were talking about screw tape letters. He did that, of course. Um, he, he's written a bunch of things. He also got into other works of fiction. So back around that same time frame, fiction about space got popular, really popular. And so he wrote a space trilogy. Um, and it's, um, what's the first one called? Uh, Paralandria, I think. Paralandria. And then, then he has, and then he has a fascinating, like, so I took a C.S. Lewis class in seminary and um, and they made us read the space trilogy and the space. The space trilogy is um, what it is, is uh, this guy named Ransom, um, which is kind of interesting. His name, he he flies to Venus, which they call which I'm pretty sure I'm, it's been a while since I've been there, but it's called Paralandria. And Paralandria, Venus, is um, a pre-fallen world, and there's an Adam and Eve on it. And they have they don't have the um, they don't have the like the tree and the apple. There are different there are different things that if they do, the world will become fallen type of thing. And uh, it's it's kind of it's kind of this fascinating fascinating picture of of kind of that world and the deceiver and kind of how they live. Um, one of my favorite pictures of the pre-fallen world comes from C.S. Lewis uh, in the fourth um, uh, Narnia book. Um, has it, has everyone read the Narnia books besides Coley? You know, like like Aslan and all that. So so that's you you. You, you read like Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe. Yeah, that's one everyone knows. So there's like five of those. And the fourth one, I think, is the, I can't remember what it's called, but, but they go back, they go back to the pre-fallen world. I mean, yeah, they, they, they kind of time travel. It's, they, it, it makes sense when you're reading it. And they, they go back to the pre-fallen world. And his picture of the pre-fallen world was, hello, the, uh, his picture of the pre, of C.S. Lewis's pre, pre-fallen world is amazingly um, 
uh, like refreshing, I think. Uh, and, and actually, you can kind of see, you can kind of, we're kind of just setting it all up. Hello. The, uh, we're, we're, um, you can kind of see, like, it, it has really influenced me, uh, that story about the pre-fallen world, because, like, someone will make a mistake, and they just laugh it off. And, like, that's, that's something that, that really hit me at, like, a very, like, intimate level. And um, that kind of adjusted my ideas of what mistakes are and, and things like that is the C.S. Lewis's Lion, Witch, in the Wardrobe series. So C.S. Lewis, is, he's a guy that has really shaped my understanding of the creation, my understanding of a lot of, a lot of stuff. He, but I wouldn't say he's one of my favorite authors. This is one of my favorite books, but he's not one of my favorite, favorite authors. Um, he, he did intimately shape one of my favorite authors though. And so that, that guy's name is N.T. Wright. Um, most stuff from N.T. Wright. I've made Lee read a few things from N.T. Wright. He's a theologian. He doesn't really write fiction that anyone knows about. And, um, and so, but his theology has intimately shaped, shaped me. And he was shaped a lot by C.S. Lewis. Um, let's see. The great, probably one of the reasons why I like The Great Divorce so much is it takes our general notions of heaven and hell and throws them on their head. And I love that. I love, like, that's, that I, I love, like, like, just that general idea going on. And, and, um, and if you ever listen to me teach anything, I, I like to take people's notions of what they know and understand and try to shine a light on those from a different perspective. And to show a show a different thing. That's that's kind of that's one of the ways I grow in the faith. And so that's kind of how I like to help people along too. So um if you if you want to feel good about your beliefs, I'm probably not the best person to hang around. Like that, that's <laughs> like uh, all that stuff. But I'll try to help you see a different perspective um of, of all those things to help you have faith in something that's outside of yourself. That's kind of the goal. Um so um, so the great divorce. So we, we've all read, were you able to read some of the beginning parts of it? Kevin, were you able to read any of it? So, so that's all right. So, so um, what, before we kind of start getting into some of the study, uh, what's something so far that really has kind of stood out to, to you that this kind of like first hit you without any kind of blush or anything like that, that that's, that you thought was kind of interesting. Anybody? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you can't bring anything from of hell to heaven. Um, yeah. So that's, is that in the first chapter? It's right there at the beginning. Yeah. It's right at the beginning. So like that, that's one of the big ideas right at the beginning um, that, that is being, is being talked about. So you can't bring anything of hell to heaven. Like that's, and that's, a, that's a very like, and, and we see that as the book progresses, it builds on that idea. It builds an idea, that idea because what I think the purpose of this book is, um, is to help us see our demons inside of us, you know, help us see our sin inside of us and to where, where we can go, Oh, <laughs> we may see ourselves in a few of the characters a little more deeply than we originally intended. Right. And it's like, Oh, maybe I need to let go of that. You know, maybe I need to let go of that because that's, that's the whole point of the book is that all these people, there, there's another thing that said at the beginning that the bus that's taking them from the gray town the bus that's taking the great town, they don't have to get on it to go back. You know, they don't, they don't have, they can stay where they are forever, you know, like the, over there. And they are choosing to go back like over there. Cause they can't let go of those things, which is fascinating. That, that is something that completely rocked my understanding of the, of the divorce between heaven and hell. When I first read, read that, I was like, Oh, that's, 
That's interesting. That's interesting. The, um, so that, that's, that's a good one. That's a good one. Was there, is there any other nuggets that, that you kind of picked up here at the beginning? Anybody? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the preface. Uh, and, you know, I think along with that, I talked about it needs to be undone. It can be undone, but it can not develop when it's good. Yeah. You can't ignore it. Yeah, yeah. So that, that yeah, evil can be can be undone, but it cannot develop into good. Blake? Oh, Blake is a guy, um, William Blake lived between, <laughs> this is the study guide on my Kindle right here. He, he lived between 1790 and 17. Oh, he wrote a book called Marriage of Heaven and Hell between 1790 and 1793. Uh, that book, he tells us that good and evil aren't really what we think they are. They're just different kinds of energies, and both are needed to keep the world going. The Bible and other religious texts, he says, have been responsible for a lot of the misinformation that we've been given. He claims that two types of people exist, the energetic creators or the devils from hell and the rational or and the rational organizers or angels from heaven, of which he claims to be are necessary to life. So what what he's saying there. So that that's William Blake. I have a feeling was much more popular back then than he probably is now um, in, in, in understandings. But that's. He's like a theologian from back in the day, you know, when C.S. Lewis was writing, writing and all that stuff. So, so he would have, um, um, so he was writing that, that you have to have good and evil in the world type of thing, which is, which is a really popular view. It's a really popular view. Um, uh, let's see, let, let me explain that a little bit. Um, the understanding of, of um, Hebrew, the, every, all the Hebrews and how they understand how the world works is that everything is inherently balanced. Now, I don't think they so much balance evil and, and good and all that stuff. They don't really balance that, but everything is balanced to the, to the Hebrew. So um, much of how you would think like what you know about like Native Americans and how they would live with the land and like, you know, using all the different parts and all that stuff. Um, Hebrews would have had a similar idea to that so much so that their language is even balanced. Like this, this idea exists so strongly in them that their entire language system balanced because every word in Hebrew for the most part has three characters in it, three characters. And then as they add on the, prefixes and the suffixes and all, all of those things to to you know to flesh out the language the the language constantly stays balanced as it's growing um so so that's it's kind of an interesting i idea and you can see that all around like like creation you know three days like the three is threes are important like all that stuff that's it's these same beats they keep hitting these balanced numbers. So that that's, and I'm sure William Blake is, is picking up on some of that wanting everything to be balanced by putting good and evil in it. And we see that C.S. Lewis is disagreeing with that. Yeah. So that's, that, that's, that's, that, that's, that's good. That's good. So that's, yeah, he's, he's really right here at the beginning. Are there any, any other interesting quotes that, that I, well, I thought about how I'm going to have to read this because I haven't read any of C.S. Lewis's stuff in a while. I do a lot of more literal <laughs> books. And so I realize I do need to read a lot slower because you get going and you're like, okay, where are they? What is this? There's no setup. But then that very first line, I seemed to be standing. And then a minute later, time seemed to have paused okay, I just need to realize he's not sure either. There's no setup because this yeah. narrator isn't really sure what's going on either. Yeah. His recollection is either fuzzy or just confusing. So, so I have to look at it from that angle and not try to just read through 
word for word, but instead just try to gain a different kind of meaning. Um, and one other thing just that I noticed in the preface um, is how he said, I would love to give credit to this person who's given me this idea for this. Oh, yeah. And I'm sorry. And I just think in our world of Google now, like there's no reason why we wouldn't be able to figure out who that author was, you know, and for him to say, I think I heard it once in some theological magazine and then just moves yeah. on. I, well, and that's a, that, that thing that he's talking about, because it was a, it was like a fiction story. Yeah. Yeah. Where a guy went back in time, back in time. And, but when you go back in time, you're not able to change anything. So everything was able to go through him and he wasn't solid anywhere, which you could see he picked up as we go along in this book, he picked up that idea. Uh, and in, in this to them walking around on the grass and things like that, as they get to the outskirts of heaven, they realize that, uh, that heaven is so much more real than they are. And, and they, that we'll get to it. And that's, I think this is chapter two. They, uh, that, they're stepping out and they realize that the blades of grass are going through them, that they're not able to bend down the, the blades of grass at all. It's so much more real than, than they are. So that's, yeah. Yeah. So that, that's that, you know, that's very, that's very cool. Cole. Like, like that's um, let's see. Um, yeah. We already talked about that. Okay. So did anyone else want to uh, add anything? That they thought was that was kind of interesting from here at the beginning. Let's see. All right. Well, so, I have lots of spots where I'd love for your uh, your study guide to help shed light on the allegory bits. You know that I'm that any of us might have missed. <laughs> the uh, in the in the um, in like the actual chapter, chapter one, yeah, stuff like that. In the first couple chapters, just any of that stuff that stood out to you. That's like. Well, this is, you know, possibly what this could have meant or, or things like that. Yeah. All right. So we can, we can get it. We can get into that. And what we'll do today. So, so the way the, the book works is that there is, um, it, it starts off in the gray town, which is like what we would center. It, it's either hell or purgatory. And, and I think he's merging those two ideas because these people can come out of it, but they kind of keep choosing it again. I think so it, in C.S. Lewis's dream, which is, that's what he says this is at the beginning of it. It's his, it's his, his dream that people are able to, you know, if they kind of are choosing to stay there, it's, it's hell, but if, they, if they're leaving, it's kind of purgatory type, type of thing. So that, that's kind of what he's saying. And again, this isn't scriptural. Let me set this up. Our concept of hell in the church, right, is often built upon foundations that aren't necessarily the Bible, okay? Um, a lot of our foundations are built upon, like, um, oh, uh, what's the, like the abyss, the seven levels of hell guy. Oh, why am I blanking on that? Dante, Dante's Inferno. A lot of our understanding of that came from from that from that book and so um so all that stuff is helpful but remember that's kind of not what it is and a lot of times the bible's concept of hell that's kind of brought out is what was um kind of uh, the understanding of it back in the time when those documents were pinned down so like a good example of that is when Saul brings Samuel back from the dead at the Witch of Endor with the Ewoks and all that. So remember, like that's never mind. That's a bad joke. But the, the Witch of Witch of Endor, and he um, he uh, when Samuel comes up, he comes up from the ground because their concept then was that the dead sleep, and so she aroused. She aroused him and all that stuff. When Jesus is walking around, he often compares uh, to the everlasting torment to the big garbage dump, Gehenna. That's what, that's what it was. And if you've ever been to a garbage dump in another country that isn't managed you know, well, like um, 
in my previous church, we did a lot of ministry uh, to uh, Guatemala and the big dump outside the city of Guatemala is always on fire. And so it's always smoky. And so we were always trying to help these people with like smoke inhalation and like eye, you know, eye infections because of the smoke that they're in constantly and stuff like that. So when Jesus says, you know, where well, the fire never goes out and all that stuff, you could see like what a uh, literal hell it would be to live on the garbage dump type, type of type of thing. So it's kind of talking about this place that isn't any fun to be in, you know, type, type of type of thing. And so that that I think is what what is he's trying to kind of get across here. And um, and so just as Dante's Inferno give us all like a picture of this, this can give us a picture of it as well. And, and we and we take the pictures, but we don't accept this as scripture, just like we don't accept Dante's as scripture, you know. So so that's but it can really help us give, get us a glimpse of that. So as we're looking at the great town and coming out of it, the next thing that happens is you meet, you're going to meet a bunch of different people. You're going to meet a bunch of different people and they're all going to have issues. You're going to, you're going to, yeah, they're all, they all have different sins. They all have different, different uh, things going on in their lives and they are all holding on to their set. That's, that's kind of how the book works. And I think that's the magic of this book is that it helps you see your, your own sin and, and all of that. So, all right, so let, let's get into, let's get into this first chapter and, um, and kind of look around uh, at what's, what's going on inside, inside of it. So, like Coley said, it starts off with the whole I seen, I seen. Um, and I think that helps because it, at least as I'm reading the book, when he is kind of trying to figure out where he's going on and where he's starting the story, everything is hazy, very little detail, very little like they, and it's, and it's almost this, this world of kind of confusion and a lot of confidence, but not a whole lot of detail, not a whole lot of substance behind it. Um, so that, that's, and that's kind of what you were talking about, Coley. Did you want to say anything more well, about? It's just like, oh, look, there's a line. I guess I better queue up, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's just kind of, kind of just things that are, um, right, right around inside of them. Um, when C.S. Lewis is writing that, it's at the height of what we call modernity. And modernity uh, really, um, really um, said that you can figure out the world. You can, if you think about it hard enough, you can figure out the world. And he kind of makes a dig at this by, by saying that, um, this is on the first page here. Um, however, afar I went, I found only dingy lodging houses, small to, tobacconists, hoard, hoardings from which posters hung in rags, windowless warehouses, good stations without trains, and bookshops of all sort that sell the works of Aristotle. That's a dig at modernity right there. <laughs> like that, that's like that, that's that's what that's what he's doing. And uh and, he, and then he says this, and I never met anyone. Like that's a, that's a very interesting picture of this world. That he's the, so you have this world that is like this massive city, but there's no one there. There's no one there. And, um, but for the, except for this little crowd, and, and just as, as Coley says, well, so we just want to, we want to queue up right away. We just want to, we want to go ahead and get, in, get in the queue. Um, let's see here. And then, so there's something interesting that happens with the, the people in the queue. Let's see if anyone, I did not recognize this until I read the little study guide. So I'm not that intelligent. Did anyone else recognize anything interesting about the people in the queue? Did anything stand out, stand out to you by them? Anybody? Do what? They were judgmental. 
They're judgmental. You're not being very loud. I don't know what's going on with your microphone, Lee. I don't know. I don't know. The, uh, I, it's, I don't know. I don't think you'll be able to turn it up. So I, I don't know what's going on. Anyway, um, so, so, they're, so they're judgmental. They're very judgmental. But something that I thought the, the, um, the study guide said, I was like, oh, that's interesting. The study guide connects their behavior to the seven deadly sins. And so here, here's, what, here's what they say. The souls that Lewis encounters while waiting for, for and getting on the bus seem to represent various forms of sin in which in what used to be called the capital sins or was commonly referred to as the seven deadly sins, associate the different personalities, his encounters in the line and on the bus with the appropriate sin below. So, so you have envy, you have gluttony, greed, lust, vanity or pride, sloth, and wrath or anger. And, and, it's, and it's almost like those characters are like an outline for the future characters we're, at, we're going to meet, you know, like all that. Because you have some people that get out, but they're, they're, all, they're all super judgy. And that's, I think that's everybody here. They're all super judgy and kind of self-righteous. They're all self-absorbed. They're all self-absorbed. Yeah. Yeah, they can't see, they can't see beyond themselves. And what and what's interesting, I, I think, um, as, as we as we continue on through this, you can see, let's see, how do I put this? You can see light in them, but they're claiming the light all for themselves. And what I mean by that is I think it's at the beginning of chapter two when the intelligent man is explaining the world and, and, he, and he's explaining it, he knows it really well. Like he's, he's figured it out, but then all he wants to do because he's figured it out is make a ton of money off of it. Like that. Oh yeah. So that's not that guy. It's, it's the guy right out, right after that. So we can, we can, we can talk, we can talk about, we can talk because that guy's kind of it's kind of the same idea that he's he's a he's a poet that at at the end you know that that there's there's he's this poet so let's 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 get there let's get there first let's see here talk real quick about another guy first so yeah. because they mentioned William Blake earlier you said you know in the preface yeah I was um I was on high alert because what I remembered about William Blake was like the age of, um innocence and experience from like high school that was that guy he was like oh there's either you're innocent or you have experience and he wrote about it and stuff so when we get to the youth but a tousle haired youth that once came and sat down beside me I was like okay I'm gonna watch this guy and see where the contrast is thinking maybe throughout this book this youthful person will be the one that kind of has the the right answers or something yeah so on the lookout for what this kid has to offer yeah, well, and that's, and, and we kind of see that that's not actually kind of the, the, the way that it goes. The guy, we that guy ends up playing the victim. For, for why C.S. Lewis is saying, you know, I, I disagree with Blake too. So, yeah. 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 I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn up the sound a little bit more in here. Right it just started raining like crazy. Oh, it passed me a minute ago. Can you say something, Coley? Yes, I can talk. I have Legos behind me because I'm a child. And it's, a <laughs> it's, it's not just Legos. It's Harry Potter Legos. And it's a salt lamp. And a salt lamp. <laughs> okay, let's see here. So, all right, so they, they line up and we have the line and we have some people that kind of get out of the line. Some people stay in it. But overall, they are very. Um, um, well, we'll we'll ask this 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 question. So, as the people continue to leave the bus line, what principle is Lewis trying to establish regarding a town in which any real life is absent, yet there is little desire to move beyond it? Like, what what do you think Lewis is trying to say in that? Does that make sense? That question. If something doesn't make sense, it's because I didn't communicate it well. You, I can, I could try to. 
I don't know. What do you, what do you think Lewis is trying to get across by the, these people, as Lee put it, were being judgy in the line? Or just discontent too. They get in yeah. the line and they get out of the line. They try to jump the line. Yeah. They're just. Yeah. They're just kind of mad. Do I? They're wayward. Like they don't really know what they're doing. They don't. They're not satisfied. Yeah. They're just stuck. And I think that I, I like that you use the word satisfied there, Coley, is that that's that's kind of what we end up seeing in this town is that the reason why it's empty is that these people aren't satisfied and can never be satisfied. So they just keep on building, building and building. Oh, yeah. All the patties. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I was last night. I was I was um, watching some videos, and I came across a comedian, and he did that same thing. I actually sent it to my friend Mark, and I said, "This is our Noah sermon," but this guy's not using any Bible stuff. I'm like, "That's that's this is what it was," but that's yeah, yeah. And that's my understanding of Noah. <laughs> like I, I'm, I'm, this has been pretty formative in my life. <laughs> like that. That's. Like all that, but yeah, yeah, not being satisfied and not, not, not needing to get along with anybody and how that results in just a gray, empty life. You know, is that, that fundamental idea of getting everything you want is actually how you get empty. It's kind of, it's kind of fascinating. It's kind of, it's kind of fascinating. Um, so, and the reason why I think that's fascinating it's because the picture of heaven that was always given to me is you get everything that you want. Yeah. That's, and, and so that's, that's why, like, I think this book shook me the first time I, I read it like that. That's because it's like, well, what, what is it then? What is it? And maybe it's not about me then like that's, Yeah, yeah. So it was interesting to me that it was kind of fulfilled in this because it was in the realm of heaven. Yeah. And the absence of God in heaven. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Think to what that was. Yeah. So this is helps. This is helping you get a picture and all that. Yeah. Oh yeah, no, there's all kinds of, there's all kinds of great, great things going on here. Let's see. So we have the line of people that are um, complaining, complaining, complaining. Um, let's see. And then we get on the vehicle itself. And um, uh, it was a wonderful vehicle, blazing in golden light, heroically colored. The driver himself seemed full of light, and he used only one hand to drive with. That's a weird detail. The only, the other, he waved before his face as if a fan, a way, to fan away the, the greasy steam of the rain. A growl went up from the queue as he came into sight. Looks like he, as if he had had a good time, huh? Bloody pleased with himself. Like these people keep complaining over and over again, right? And, and it's interesting how C.S. Lewis, like you can picture that bus, right? And you can picture that bus. It's like this thing that's kind of light and everyone's complaining about it, which we're going to see as a theme as we continue to go through that they get to the outskirts of heaven. This is where they're getting to. And they're getting to the outskirts of heaven and they're complaining about the brilliance and the light of it, which is, which is, which is fascinating, which is fascinating. Uh, let's see here. Um, so here's, here's the guy that Coley was talking about. I'm, I'm down a few paragraphs. I thought you wouldn't mind if mind my tacking on to you, he said. So this is the the young the young fellow, the poet. For I noticed that you that you feel just as I do about our present company. All right. So why on earth they insist on coming? I can't imagine. They won't like it at all when they get there, and they really, and they'd really be much more comfortable at home. It's different for you and me. Here's what's interesting. As you keep on reading this, 
they keep referring back to their place as home, as that, as that, they could just go back home. They can just go back to the gray town and all that stuff. They, and it seems like almost everyone keeps referring to that as like, you can just go back home. And that's um, the, uh, you're looking at papers. Did you want to say something? Okay. So, um, so they continue in this conversation. Do they like this place? I asked as much as they like anything. He answered, they've got cinemas, fish and chip shops, advertisements, all sorts of things that they want. The appealing lack of any intellectual life doesn't worry them. We're starting to see himself here. I realized as soon as I got here that they, that they had been some mistake. So he's talking, it's like, I shouldn't, I shouldn't be here. And what's interesting is we go through here. What was your sense of this first young man? What did you, what did you think as you were, as you were listening to him? Do you remember? Does anyone remember? Very arrogant. And why, why do you think arrogant? Why do you, do you remember? Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 Like that's, that, that's very, that's, it's so, it's so true. It's so true. It is. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I, I think that, that that character probably has like, a, Oh, I just need to get away from these people sense about them that it's like, what's, what's going on here, which is interesting because he's in the gray world. That's kind of how everyone feels in the gray town. Right. But, and that guy comes up to him, but, um, but yeah, so I think he kind of gloms onto him, but we end up seeing like, why does he want to glom onto him? What's he, what's he end up doing? Do you remember? Yeah. He gives him all of this poetry at his works. It's like, can you look over this? Like that's, it's, he's like a, he's like a intellectual huckster, right? Like, like that, that's, he's just, he's just like, Hey, you know, check this over. Like be amazed at my, my intellect. And, and that's because he seems like, I think Coley reading this and she said that he, he first seemed like he was, he was um, um, going to be kind of this righteous kind of stalwart, almost like the guide through the book. And he falls off the rails so quickly, which I thought was, I thought was interesting. Like, Carol, that's you know? I'm saying, I think that's intentional with him, like saying that stuff about William Blake possibly too. Yeah. I yeah. did not read too much into stuff, you know? <laughs> um what did she say okay so the 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 young guy said he should have been on the first bus i i think i i like what would you what do you think i have an idea but i mean this is all just like kind of like that oh, what do you how's this hitting you so how does that hit you that he feels like he should be on that first bus i figured it was probably yeah. Yeah. No, I think I think I think that's kind of what it is that he he knows that there was a better bus to be on. You know, and you can see that that's how that's actually how he thinks his whole life should have been. He should have he like it was all these people that were holding him down. Right. It was all these people that were holding them back. If these people didn't exist, then my life would have been so much better. Mm -hmm. They they're and I think he's like he's the one that's like rails against capitalism, and, and uh, which is which is kind of funny because C.S. Lewis does. It's another thing that's kind of located in that time frame. But he rails against capitalism, declares that he's communist but then finds out that the capitalist nations are aligned with the communist nation in World War II. And so he says that, well, I'm just against, I'm a conscientious objector. You know, so, so I, and I think C.S. Lewis is kind of saying like, well, this guy doesn't believe in anything. You know, like that's like, he, he doesn't, he doesn't like the capitalism because he's not getting anything from it. And he's not, and he doesn't like the communism now because he's not getting anything from it. So that that's so I think the bus is like another analogy of him doing that as he's coming on to it. That that he's that he's not 
the world is holding him down still. He knows of a better way and he's not on it. So that's, that's interesting. Yeah. I don't know if that's true or not, but it's cool. It's cool to think about it. Let's see. So, all right. The, the last, last little bit, um, last little bit, last, last couple paragraphs, realizing with a shudder that what he was producing from his pocket was a thick wad of typewritten paper. I muttered something about not having my spectacles and exclaimed, hello, we've left the ground. And it was true, several hundred feet below us, already half hidden in the rain and mist, the wet roofs of the town appeared, spreading without a break as far as the eye could reach. Like what, a, what a fascinating picture right there that this town that we, we already see is just empty and desolate. And it just goes on and on without, without end, without end. And we kind of find out why in the, in the, next, in the next chapter here. The, um, let's see. Let's see if there's an interesting question from, from, this, this, from this first chapter here. Um, I think about his choice to let the uh, bus go up. Yeah. Well, just, you know, as far as heaven, hell, up, down, I don't know. Yeah. You know, they ascend. Yeah, they ascend. They're, ascend, they're ascending out of it. Which in this, and, and I also think for, for those that have read the entire book and know how it ends, I think it's interesting the amount of time that C.S. Lewis spends on describing how vast that gray town is and how it just goes for miles and miles and miles. And we're seeing, I think it's chapter two, they start talking about like millions of miles and, and think things like, things like that, you know, like that, that's, that, that, that's that, <laughs> how big it is and, and how that's going to, um, our concept of that is going to change as you get to the end of the book and you realize how big it is. And so that's, that's the kind of the fest. If you haven't gotten to the end yet, I'm not going to spoil it for you, but, uh, but you can look for it. You can look for it. So, um, all right, let's go to, let's go to chapter two that we discussed pretty much all their, their questions in there. Um, let's see, here's, here's their description of chapter two. As the bus is en route to an unknown, but presumably better destination, we, we learned a little bit more about the great town as well as the passengers on the bus. It's the setting that we learn that not all the passengers are going to heaven for the right reasons, but rather to get something for themselves. And the, the quote from this chapter that they liked is, the, the, the trouble is that they have no needs. You get everything that you want. Not very good quality, of course. Just, just imagining it. Okay. So we begin with the, with the poet. And... Um, so begin with the, you know, I was left very long at the mercy of this tussle-headed poet because another passenger interrupted our conversation. But before that happened, I had learned a great deal about him. He appeared to be a similarly ill-used man. His parents had never appreciated him. None of his five schools in which he had been educated seemed to have had any provision for a talent or temperament such as his. To make matters worse, he had been exactly the sort of boy whose case was um, examination system works out with a minimum fairness and absurdity. <laughs> so he keeps on making excuses, right? He's just, just filled with excuses. And, um, and I, and listen, that stuff hits me hard because it sure is easy to make excuses when things don't go well. You know, it's like, Oh, that was a hard situation, you know, and maybe it was, but like, so, yeah, it, it's, Oh yeah, and this this is the part where we already kind of talked about all of this. Sorry, Carol. <laughs> like I was, I was just, I was just talking about what I thought was in chapter one. Um, let's see here. So um, let's continue on, continue on. So there's a, there's like a there's like a fight that's on the bus, 
And um, I don't know how, how far I'm in, into all this, but it's after the poet. It was just then that we were interrupted. It was kind of one of the quarrels, which were perpetually simmering on the bus, boiled over, and for a moment there was a stampede. Knives were drawn, pistols were fired, but it all seemed strangely innocuous. And when it was over, I found myself unharmed, though in a different seat with a new companion. He was an intelligent-looking man with a rather bulbous nose and a, and a bowler hat. I looked out of the windows. We were now so high that all below us had become featureless, but fields, rivers, and mountains I did not see. And I got the impression that the gray town still filled the whole field of vision. Fascinating thing. So what I think is interesting about that is so is, is how he's communicating the feeling of that bus trip. So, so we got this feeling of this kind of empty, gray, desolate town, right? And now we have this thing where all of a sudden someone shoots a gun on a bus and, and, and all, all that, like, and it's just, it, it causes a commotion for a second. Then all of a sudden he finds himself sitting with another one, another person and looking out a window, you know, that he's saying like, well, there's nothing wrong, you know? Like, it's just, it's just kind of this sense of, like, as you're reading it, it's like, you should be more upset about this than you are about what's happening in the situation that you're in. So, like, I don't know. That's how it hit me. I don't know if it hit anyone else differently. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, like, that's, I, well, and I, I don't know. It, it's, it's just an odd situation. Like, knives are drawn. Like, it's just. You feel weird, but he just goes right back to, you know, what he was doing before. So let me read about this guy. This guy, I think, is fascinating. Um, this is the intelligent guy. It seems uh, the juice of a town I, I, I volunteered. That's what I can't understand. The parts of it I saw were so empty. There was such a larger population. Not at all, said my neighbor. The trouble is that they're so quarrelsome. As soon as anyone arrives, he settles in on some street. Before he's been there 24 hours, he quarrels with his neighbor. Before the week is over, he's quarreled so badly, he decides to move. Very likely, he finds the next street empty because all the people there have quarreled with their neighbors and have moved. So he settles, settles in. If by any chance the street is full, he goes further. But even if he stays, it makes no odds. He's sure to have another quarrel pretty soon, and then he'll move on again. Finally, he'll move right out to the edge of the town and build a new house. You see, it's easy here. You've only got to think a house, and there it is. That's how the town keeps on growing, leaving more and more empty streets. So what do, what do, you, think of, what do you think of that, that, that whole idea? We kind of talked about it. That's my, this is kind of my fascinating bit with this book. Yeah. What did you say, Chloe? That satisfaction thing again is coming up. They're never yeah. satisfied. That they can't be, that they just can't be satisfied. Yeah. Well, I guess there's no pleasing you. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that, that's a, we had a, we had a friend with a three-year-old staying at our house once. And one night there was, the there was no pleasing the three-year-old. I, <laughs> I don't know why he keeps throwing me off. What's going on, Lee? I can I, hear you now. Oh, you can hear me now? It keeps throwing me off. Oh. Oh, you've never left to us. Well, I'm not <laughs> seeing you guys. Oh, really? I can see you. Your, your microphone's acting weird, though. I don't know what's going on. As I, I can sometimes hear you really well and sometimes not. This may be an allegory for your life. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. There we go. Can you hear me? Am I still bad? or? No, you're good. You're good. No, I'm good. It keeps going in and out. It's weird. It's weird. Yeah. All right. So, um, so. So, yeah, so I think that's kind of a, a key idea there that, that, that everyone's kind of, they've quarreled with their neighbors, just like the Noah thing, you know, like that's, that I think that's a big part. And I, and I, 
And I think we have to watch ourselves that we don't just, ah, I'm done with this. And we, and we go and we go out and we kind of, we continue to live our, our lives. Like that Popeye's chicken was nasty to me. I'm never going back there. You know, like, I, I don't, you know, I, I don't, I don't know. I don't know if there's a whole lot of life in that. And I think that's kind of what his critique is, what his critique is there. And that, I think that says a lot for churches too, that when we look around for perfect churches, probably never find it, you know, like that, that's, and that, that's as someone who tries to make a perfect church, got to have perfect people. Right. And, uh, and so like that, that, and that may be a fool's errand that may be a fool's errand. So, so that, that's kind of, that's, that's kind of how I, how I read it. Um, let's see here. Um, what, what's it, what's an interesting part in this? Uh, do, 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 do. There's the part where he wants, yeah, yeah, to the edge of town. Oh, yeah. So the they said that there were some peoples that went, people that went to try to find Napoleon, and then also kind of Genghis Khan, Julius Caesar, all all these all these people that they tried to find them, and it's like, what? Well, what were they doing? They were just in their house by themselves. You know, like that's that's kind of that kind of walking, walking around. Um, so, so then, all right, so I'm going to pick up, uh, it's a couple pages from where, where I just read. Then the town will go on spreading indefinitely. I said, that's right. Said the intelligent man, <laughs> unless someone can do something about it. How do you mean? Well, as a matter of fact, between you and me and the wall, that's my job at the moment. What's the trouble about this place? Not that the people are quarrelsome, that's only human nature and was always the same, even on earth. I love this guy because everything seems to be like he seems to get it. <laughs> and then and then he goes off the rails. They they <laughs> like, and that's and that's what I was talking about at the beginning, that these guys seem like they have light, but then they, they always go off the rails. Um, so he sees the problem that these people aren't together anymore. The trouble is that they have no needs. You get everything you want. Not very good quality, of course, just by imagining it. That's why it never costs any trouble to move to another street or to build another house. In other words, there's no proper economic basis for any community life. If they need real shops, chaps would have to stay near where the real shops were. If they need real homes, they'd have to stay where the builders are. It's scarcity that enables society to exist. Well, that's where I come in. I'm not, going, I'm not going on this trip for my health. As far as that goes, I don't think it would suit me up there. But if I can come back with some real commodities, anything at all that you could really bite or drink or sit on, why at once you'd get demand in, your, in, your, in our town. I'd start a little business, have something to sell, You'd soon get people coming to live near centralization. Two fully inhabited streets would accommodate the people that are, that are now spread over millions of square miles of empty streets. I'd make a nice little profit and be a public benefactor as well. What, what, do, you think, what do you think of that? What do you think of that? Like that's a more self-absorption? He's got his own agenda, right? Like he wants to go to the outskirts of, of heaven to pick up something solid to take back to sell it. And, 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 I, and I, I think that's fascinating is, is that, that, you know, it's like, oh, let's, let's take these things that, that are fundamentally good and just and the, whole, the whole reason why I want to be there is just to, to make a profit off of it. Like that, that. they have the choice to go back and forth. Well, I think, well, I don't know. I don't know. Like, I think he may because, know. Yeah, go ahead. Well, I, because I'm thinking that like, so he has the interest of taking a, a pleasing part or a pleasing attribute of heaven, but he doesn't want to actually immerse himself in heaven. Like he'd rather stay in this 
gray area with just a little aspect of something heavenly than be there. Yeah. That's, that's a great way of putting it. That's a, that's a great way of, of putting it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and perhaps he's been on the journey before who knows, perhaps he heard something about it. You know, like that's that everything is like everything in this book is you're, you're kind of figuring things out as you go. It, it doesn't, it, this book never lays things out really for you like that and goes, this is how you should feel about this. And so, so yeah, that, that's, that's, Oh yeah. Yeah. And that's part of, yeah, that's part of your thing. You can't, you can't have the two things, right? Like he's trying to take a piece, a piece of heaven back, which, which is comical because Gloria, you're the only one that's read to the end now, right? Oh, you read to the end. Too. Yeah. Which is comical because it wouldn't fit like that. That's like, you know, like he, he just hasn't, he has no concept of how, how, how uh, big he is, you know? And, um, yeah, so that's that. That's great. Let's see. Um, so, so he, so he's trying to take these things for these heavenly things that are more solid, and trying to, and it, and it's all good things trying to bring people back together and all that, but it, it's that's really not his intention. You know, he wants people to be living together closer so that he can make more off of them, and so. So we have our we have our our, our, our tossle headed poet. We have the the intelligent man, and then we then we meet our next guy, and that's what this sheet of paper is. Oh, and I can give you guys in the live stream one of these. This is not the best sheet of paper, but it kind of helps see what chapters each character is in. This I found on on um, I found on. Uh, online. So, so it's someone else's study. We're, we're not going through this, but, but it kind of helps you see, see that here. So the uh, fat, clean shaven man is kind of the next person that comes in. And um, what's, what's interesting about him is it kind of comes out that he's an Episcopal priest. And he doesn't really stand for anything. You know, like that's, he's just, let's see, he's um, faux, faux intellectual honesty, intellectual pre prejudice is kind of what, what, the little, what the little thing says here. And um, let's see here. I don't have a good quote from him. Is this him here? All right, so it's almost the end of the, this chapter. Excuse me, he said, but I couldn't help overhearing parts of your conversations. Astonishing how these primitive superstitions linger on. I beg your pardon. Oh, God bless your soul. That's all it is. There is not a shred of evidence that this twilight will is ever going to turn into the night. And so he starts, he starts uh, justifying hell there. There, there has been a revolution of opinion on, on it in educated circles. I'm surprised that you haven't heard of it. All the nightmare fantasies of our ancestors are being swept away. What we now see is this subdued and, and delicate half-light is the promise of the dawn, the slow turning of a whole nation towards the light, slow and imperceptible, of course, and not through eastern windows only the daylight comes in the light and the passion for real commodities which our friend speaks of as only materialism you know is retrogressive earthbound a hankering for matter we look on the spiritual city for with all of its faults it is spiritual as a nursery in which creative functions of man now freed from the clogs of matter begin to try their wings and sublime thought so he it's interesting how he com, how he talks about that he's he's he starts spiritualizing this place that the gray town and everything that is in it he starts spiritualizing that and and he's saying that that it means that it's holy and that it is good 
yeah, it's got its faults. It's not so good, but, but we're, we're seeing it. We're seeing it through, right? We're, we're seeing it through and, and that it's fundamentally good. But what's interesting in the coming chapters, we find out that, that the heavenly realm isn't so much spiritual, but it's like this, it's so much substance that these people can't even interact with, it, which is kind of, which is kind of interesting. And that kind of goes against sometimes our, our concept of that. If it means it's spiritual, it's good type of thing. Um, one thing that has been my um, rallying cry for quite some time has been, um, has been the, the over spiritualization of things uh, that we take it a little too far. And, and we, um, we, that, that God created the world and he created it good. And that, you know, this physical is good. And I think the the resurrection of Jesus shows us that the physical is, is good. And, you know, he didn't raise up in some spiritual sense, you know, he didn't, it wasn't raised up as a hologram or something like that, but it was raised up bodily and he rose into heaven bodily and, and, and all that. So, so the, the physical is good too. And that's, that's one thing I like about this book too, is that it, it honors it honors that, that, that view. Um, okay, so the last full paragraph uh, I have marked to read. So we'll, we'll read that. I glanced around the bus through the windows. The, uh, though the windows were closed and soon muffed, the bus was full of light. It was cruel light. I shrank from the, fa- uh, I shrank from the faces and forms by which I was surrounded. They are all fixed faces. Full, full, not of possibilities, but impossibilities. Some gaunt, some bloated, some glaring with idiotic ferocity, some drowned beyond recovery in dreams, but all in one way or another, distorted and faded. One had a feeling that they might fall to pieces at any moment if the light grew much stronger. Then there was a mirror at the end and end wall of the bus and i caught sight of my own and still the light grew what do you what do you think of that paragraph here to end this chapter and in the study today what do you what do you think what do you think about that light that Let's make a comment as to what he saw can you repeat that lee he doesn't make a comment as to actually what he saw. Okay. I caught sight of my own. Yeah. And then the light. But he doesn't tell you what he looks like compared to the other. Yeah, he doesn't. He doesn't. How, how, do, you, how do you think? Why don't you think he, he tells? He doesn't tell you what he sees. What do you think? So that I can... No, that I don't see what I am either. So he, so Lee says he doesn't see what he is either. And what'd you say, Gloria? Oh, and he doesn't. He doesn't seem to think that he's one of the fans. Okay, so he so he catches himself. So 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 Gloria Gloria can thinks that he he thinks that he's still a little better than than them because yeah. He sees, he's, he's okay. So, so you're kind of looking at the he, he, he almost sees himself and all that too. Yeah. So, okay. So that that's, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's so 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 you she just said that it, that can you guys hear her? Okay. So um, I need to get the microphone closer next time. The uh, she said that that he so um uh, that that she was uh, that that he saw himself in kind of in that same sense that everyone else was on that bus and, and Gloria saying that, that he, he, he may see himself as better than everyone else. Like that's, and that's the brilliance of this book is that, that it's like, it, there's so many, so many ways that things could be seen and interpreted. And you're kind of looking things through, through, you know, your, your eyes and how you, how you understand what's going on. It's a cool book. It's a cool book. Is, was there anything else there that kind of, that kind of um, stood out to you. 
Yeah, I was about to mention that. Yeah. And that they were scared of the light or he was scared of the light. That it was revealing their nature. Like that even though the 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 windows were closed, that like there's brilliant light was coming from the bus and it was kind of and it was and it was kind of revealing everything that was going on to them. Which it just which is fa- fascinating. 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 So so that that's good. All right. So for next week, uh, let's kind of have read through five. I don't know if we'll get through that, but it doesn't take that long. So read through five and, um, and we'll, we'll go through that. We'll also go through um, the characters before we get to them uh, next week. So we'll, we'll, we'll do that, but it's great. It's great seeing, seeing everybody. And I mean, you don't have to just stop at five too. You can read the whole thing if you want to. The whole book should take you about three hours and 15 minutes to read. It's, 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 not, it's not that long. So, um, so but it's a it's fascinating book. Thanks for, thanks for everyone talking and, and, and things like that. Because it's as we kind of go through this book and see, see sin in ourselves, and, and, ho- and hopefully we can release some of that. And um, that, that's, that's good news. Sarah, I'll say a prayer for us. Jesus, we thank you for this day and it's all, all that you've given us. Lord, continue to help us uh, shed off um, our, our sinful, sinful sides that we may hold fast to your resurrection and your newness of life. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Good stuff. Thanks so much, everybody. We'll do this again next week. Same time. Bye. Bye.